Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Today, I want to talk about time banking. Have you heard of it? Do you know what it is? It's new to me and I'm very much interested in investigating because anything that gets us out of the rotten system that we're in, where we're being taken advantage of in a debt society and moving on to something else and stave off those dreadful CBDCs, etc., etc., uh, is got to be good. So my guest today is a lady called Neve. She's an ex-nurse of 27 years and she's also a whistleblower. She's been working with a natural law group which she chairs and looks at future systems which includes time banking. Neve, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you with me. Hello Richard, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's, let's have a quick uh, find out about your whistleblowing because I think whistleblowing is something that should be encouraged if there is fraud and corruption going on and people should feel safe to be able to talk about it and not be pushed um, aside or, or persuaded to shut up. That's right, yes. Um, I was a nurse for 27 years. 21 of those years was spent um, managing care homes and dementia units. And it's quite a notorious case of neglect over in Liverpool, where I was the whistleblower. Um, as an elderly, involved an elderly lady. Um, it did go to uh, Crown Prosecution, and I was the prosecution witness. But being the whistleblower, I was initially set up, you know, to be the scapegoat. But mm. thankfully, the police saw through all that. Um, but I te- did you are you telling me that the police actually did something good for a change? I have to say, yes, they did. Uh, my- oh, good. Yeah, that day I was first interviewed, I really thought the odds were stacked against me because I thought it was me against a multinational private health corporation. Um, And I just thought I was on a hiding to nothing, you know. Um, But when I sat down, um, the detective chief inspector, he was so kind and so good. And he told me they were coming to arrest me initially. Um, But the relatives of the lady concerned asked them to dig deeper and told them that I was the only nurse who'd actually cared for their mother. So, yes, so that's Uh, on on this journey, really. Right. Well, I mean, it is certainly encouraging to hear that, you know, good stories about the police because we hear so many bad stories. And I'm sure plenty of people watching have those up their sleeve. But it is encouraging that there are some good guys out there. So that's good. Um, so yes, yeah, so then you that, as you just said, then it brought you down on, onto a, a path that you hadn't chosen. Um, so tell us a little bit about your natural law group that you um, that you chair. Yes, um, well. I was very fortunate to uh, bump into some like-minded people at the stand in the park during, you know, lockdowns and all the rest Mm. of it, and was first introduced to common law and uh, the different jurisdictions and realised the fraud that, you know, we've all been exposed to and indoctrinated into from birth. So a few of us decided to get together and put together this knowledge um, and put it to the test and became sort of guinea pigs, if you like, and stopped paying bills, um, gas, water, electricity, council tax, parking fines, speeding fines, and putting things to the test. And as a consequence, I set up what we call the rapid response team. So anyone's dealing with the unlawful and illegal activity of bailiffs and police or any enforcement agent, they just call one of the team and we'll, you know, arrive en masse. And wow. To date, I have to say, um, it's quite an accolade. We have 100% success in seeing bailiffs and police off premises. Um, so the, the team uh, is phenomenal. Oh, congratulations on that. That is, I mean, it's just so, it's so encouraging from me from this perspective because I'm talking to so many different people and they're doing similar things. And it's so encouraging because people are doing this and they're beginning to become more confident and and you know people like you who are setting these things up should well be congratulated because you're you know as a guinea pig as you said you're trying it out and it's great that you're able to achieve these sort of things 
Yes, but as I say, I can't take the credit on my own. I'm um, working with some phenomenal people, and I hope mm. you don't mind me uh, naming them, but, you know, Dave McGuinness, Don Cavana, Sarah, Dave Downs, um, they're all phenomenal people, and their knowledge together, one incredible team. Um, and as I say, we've had 100% success. We're teaching people how to write the lawful notices and with, you know, uh, draw consent, um, you know, the sort of implied consent that was never given in the first place because yes. fraud runs through and you know negates all contracts anyway um so we're having some success with some of the uh, group members also reclaiming some money as well uh, oh but fantastic so that's very positive so yeah that's the monday group uh, fighting the current system um uh, lawfully um and that's linked in really with our sort of other sort of support services and systems that we're creating as well with the time banking and um, what we call gardens of hope our health team that we call rise um and our life skills curriculum so, uh, right that so there's a lot going on you're a very busy lady then by the sounds of things yes. um but all all in the right direction which is so great so so time banking can you explain what that is Yes. Um, well, as we most of us have come to realise now that the fiat currency, you know, it, it's backed by nothing and we may as well be passing around, you know, sweet wrappers. Um, yes. Absolute insanity, you know. So we give all our labour and our time to, you know, for these sort of IOU notes and to make other people richer whilst we're just fed crumbs from the table. Well, we all have choices. We have free will and we have choices. So some of us choose not to be in this current system and the anticipated systems of control and surveillance. And we want um, a life of abundance and freedom and peace and unity. Mm. So what we have done is we're using time as currency now, it's a very strange concept for those who've never heard of it before, because, of course, we've only ever dealt with currency. Mm. So rather than be paid in currency for the time, we are credited the time into a bank account. So everyone who signs up is automatically credited with 100 hours in their current account. Um, no one can go um, three hours in the negative in the red. So they have to try and contribute to the hub, to the community, to keep it afloat. Um, for every hour donated to the hub, five minutes is credited to that person's pension account. So the whole idea is to keep the current account low whilst building the pension account. So we pledge our knowledge, skills and experience, and if we're willing to teach. And we have a directory of services of who has what skills and what geographical areas they're willing to cover. And we have an admin team over different sort of aspects, so sort of domestic um, support, transport services, the health, the actual admin for the time banking itself, and for the gar what we call gardens of hope for the growing food. So we have different admin teams. Um, the health team, uh, the health is called RISE, which is an acronym for Rediscovering Ancient Healing Practices. I is for inspiring people to take responsibility for their own health. S is for spirituality, because we're not just physical beings. And E is for embodiment, because we're not just physical beings. And the whole idea is that the RISE team are paid from the community pot. So as people uh, donate hours to the t uh, to the hub as i say five minutes is credited to their pension account but five minutes is also credited to the community part then for instance the life skills curriculum um i am a keen gardener and i do teach organic growing and permaculture it just happens to have been a, a skill and a passion of mine and uh, to sort of de-stress from a very stressful, demanding job, you know, managing dementia units. So, mm. it, Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. So a very keen, passionate gardener for 30 years. 
Um, so I have been teaching permaculture and organic growing. And so say, for instance, I was to do a, a lecture seminar on permaculture and I knew that it was going to take two hours to deliver, but a couple of hours to set up and do all the groundwork. So say three hours, so that's five hours. And then an hour, um, to, you know, sort of post delivery, consolidating the lecture, if you like. So that would be six hours. And say in the hub, 10 people wanted to attend that lecture. So they know it's going to be two hours. So two hours would come off each of their current accounts. So that would create 20 hours. So for the six hours that I've put in to deliver that, that would be that would come off those 20 hours, leaving 14. Those remaining 14 hours get accredited to the community pot to pay to, for the health team. And then it, as we're exchanging skills and services directly, um, the time comes off each other's bank accounts. So it does sound complicated, but it, it is a very, very simple concept. Right. I mean, like so many things that are simple, on the face of it, when you're trying to sort of break it down, it can seem a bit uh, a bit complicated. So yeah. if it's based on people's time... Some people, um, how is that r related to their skill sets? Because some people might say, oh, my skill set is worth more than somebody else's skill set. You see, that's the current ideology with the yes. thinking, you know, we've been indoctrinated into. At the end of the day, time is time. What right. makes your time more valuable than mine? You know, because um, somebody actually said to me, well, you've got a doctor who's trained for years and years, and you've got someone who just mowed, and they said just the word just, just mows the lawn. You know, how does that equate? And I said, well, a skill is a skill, time is time, you know. Um, and the problem with the society that we've been indoctrinated into, we've had this sort of superior class system that someone's skills is worth more than another. Um, and that's just not true, you know. Um, it's about you. But, but in your, um, and I don't mean, I'm not, I'm not criticising, I'm just exploring this. In your doctor's example, they may have put several years aside where they could not practice in order to get to the point where they're able to open their door to the public. Yes. And then they may, you know, only be able to do so many hours a week because of what they do. Um, and as, so if you took an extreme example of, say, a brain surgeon, um, well, I suppose a brain surgeon is going to be there spending eight hours sorting out one patient, but he may have a whole load of other work. But either way, I suppose the argument, as you've just presented it, someone will say, well, I've, I've spent five, eight years, ten years, whatever it is, training to do something which may only take an hour at the end of it. How is it that I get remunerated for that? Well, that brain surgeon still needs a house cleaning, still needs dogs walking, still needs children educating, still needs a garden maintaining, still needs to grow food um, mm. and feed the family. Um, you know, so it comes down to support um, and pooling our skills and knowledge together. Um, uh, I mean, for instance, the likelihood of us needing a brain surgeon, thank God, is quite remote. Uh, well, my son actually needed a brain surgeon because he had a he had a brain bleed. But it, um, and and they are very busy. But well, you're quite are, right. Yes, but um, the, the strangest coincidence, Richard, is as I said, I was a nurse for 27 years and managed care homes for 21. The six years prior to that, I was a theatre nurse and specialised in neuro. So. You know, <laughs> I ha have actually participated and, you know, and, you know, assisted with brain surgery. So yeah. um, so I do know that obviously people have traumatic events in life and health issues, obviously. Um, but thankfully, the chances of that happening are quite, you know, far and few. They are. I agree that, I mean, it is they are rare. Um, Where, uh, I, say, for instance, you were laid up in bed with a you know a broken leg or um a, a heavy cold of the flu you know your dog still needs walking you mm. know so that sort of exchange of skills and you know and that's likely to happen far more than the chances of you needing 
No, but I'm just thinking if you've got to if you've got to invest time yes. um, over a, a, say three or five years, whatever it is, yeah. uh, in order to get to the point where you're able to then charge for services that you've trained for. There's five years yeah. in which you're not earning because yeah. you're you're spending money to, or you've right. got a grant or whatever yeah. it is to get there. Uh, yeah. You may feel that I would like those five years of earnings coming back somehow from what I end up doing. This leads me to um, a gentleman that the universe has connected me with, um, a gentleman who actually only lives about three miles away from me, um, Peter. And Peter's setting up a system. Um, and the strange thing is we've both come up with a similar concept, but he's come from a technical angle, whereas mine's been the more sort of humanitarian angle. Right. And he's developing a technical side with... Um, um, you know, apps and things, but also a bartering and exchange system with also a currency that he, he calls L, Alpha Love Live Lifelong Learning. So it's not just a case of exchange and barter time for time. There's also the, um, uh, you know, chance and choice of uh, increasing um, expenses for people who've got sort of specialist niche skills um as you're saying such as a brain surgeon so they can exchange and barter as well and also use this l currency um i did ask if peter wanted to come on here today with you um, and talk with you but he says it's very embryonic and he would like to come on on your show in about three four months time when he's got yeah, something, yeah, no problem got something a bit more concrete to yeah just, but so we're not just discussing um, the time banking. We are looking at other elements to account for that sort of anomaly. That is yes, quite rightly. I suppose if you've got, I mean, and, and I'm just thinking off the off the top of my head here. If you've got somebody who who, in order, like say, a, a veterinarian to look after animals, still got to go under training. Yes. But if you know within your environment that that veterinarian is going to be serving you, presumably, the, the your um, your your community could support that person while they do their training, absolutely. And then and then they've agreed that they will, of course, be able to look after all the animals um, because they've been supported with food and and all the other bits and bobs that they need um, and and helping with bills being paid whilst they do that very important training. So everybody is supporting one another. That's right. That, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, Peter's system is slightly different to mine. And my, my system with the training, um, you paid to be trained, as I explained before, with your time. But with uh, Peter's system, the actual the students get paid for their time in attendance. So we're still sort of tweaking that, really. Right. Uh, but it sounds like the long term um, training courses, such as medicine and veterinary practice, Peter's system would be far more viable. Right. I mean, the main thing is, it, it, it seems to me, that the fact that people like yourself and others are thinking in a more holistic and positive way to how you help people um, and, and paying for um, the things that they need to do or the training they need to do or, or just, as you say, just doing more. Um, and, I, and I've just done the same thing by putting just in, but by doing those other services, which are equally important, like helping people walk the dog if they can't get out or mowing the lawn or painting, or whatever it is, haircuts, uh, something that obviously I have a, a lot of trouble with. Um, those sort of things that that we do need on a daily, on a on a, on a certainly on a weekly basis or whatever, yes. um, and and the uh, the debt currency that we have is keeping us down and constantly keeping us in that negative loop. So um, I'm I'm very much encouraged that uh, that this sort of thing is is going on. W what other future you talk about the the growing and um the other things tell us a bit about those as well what you're doing with your within your community yes absolutely we've adopted a strategy that was actually developed down south by a gentleman called daniel um it's called gardens of hope and it's based on a model by an indian lady called vandana shiva um, and the Gardens of Hope concept is that people come together, pledge their gardens for growing food, and also um, 
preferably um, what we have um, a blitz, what we call a blitz team. So they're going on site and getting people's gardens ready for next season and making sure that they've got all the utensils and everything they need. We're asking people, um, elderly people with garden space and disabled people with garden space to pledge their gardens and teaming them up with able-bodied people who don't have garden space so they can support one another. And that concept is very much in its infancy but is doing very well. Um, we have one gentleman in particular, um, a young disabled gentleman, who was quite depressed, could no longer tend to his garden. It was all overgrown. And um, one of our group knows him. So she had a word with him and he was all for it. And he said if we could get his patio sort of um, usable for him, because it was overgrown with buddleia, if we could get it usable for him, he pledged the last two thirds of his garden space um, for growing uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And the first day, seven of the Blitz team turned up and we cleared his patio. Well, the poor man was nearly in tears and uh. in oven, was giving us all chocolates. And, you know, it was really sweet, you know, really <laughs> nice. So, and, uh, and presumably they benefit as well from the food that's grown. Absolutely. And yeah. the, the team that are, I've put on that site, um, the, the three um, able to, who are on that site working on um, Carl's Garden, they've said um, they couldn't believe the therapeutic benefits for them because they don't really have garden space. And they said how much they've enjoyed it and how yeah. much they've got out of it being with nature and working together as a team and and learning and you know so it has been great fun and yeah unifying really putting the unity back into community and 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 this is quite interesting because we've gone through this very difficult period um and we may have some more difficulties ahead of course yes. um but in a way it it has brought people back together you know enlightened people who are thinking hang on a minute if we carry on on this path that we have where we're atomized we're behind screens we're indoors we're we're letting the government or the councils do everything for us we're not taking responsibility and people like that gentleman who can't get out into his garden is then just looking at the overgrown thing and 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 being depressed by it all because it seems nothing has happened it it's actually opened up a, a silver lining that I think people are beginning to realise, wow, what an opportunity to bring back the fun, OK, hard work, but rewarding, pride and, and all those sort of things. Oh, absolutely, Richard. It's, it's been great. I mean, um, I say just to see this man's face at the transformation of his patio and in nearly in tears and mm. then i say that the people who have put on the team on that site who were worrying about growing food because they know what's coming you know or what we expect and what we anticipate is coming and their concern about how they're going to grow food and not having the space and and putting that together and they're all supporting one another and it was carl who suggested well they have a kitty for the team to buy you know things on site um so he started a kitty and they've all put in 50 pound each to buy resources and we've been sourcing free pallets and um, shipping crates to create vegetable beds and things and you know um looking for old children's trampolines to turn that you know the hoops into um polytunnels and that kind of thing oh right oh brilliant yeah a lot of imagination going on there you yeah. said you worked in in care homes do care homes have relatively large gardens that could be turned into food sources um, some of them do, yes. I mean, a lot of them have sensory gardens anyway for right. people with dementia, you know, people with visual yes. problems and uh, sensory problems. So they do have uh, sensory gardens with, you know, lots of lavenders and, and um, you know, uh, roses and smelling, you know, plants and things. Um, so, and of course, gardening is therapeutic. And so a lot of them do have little gardening clubs where the more able-bodied will try and yes. put plants and things. Um, but with regards to growing food, Food. I don't think so much of that is going on, no, but it's certainly to be encouraged. Well, I, I mean, I know my dad um, unfortunately had to go into a home for a year and he deteriorated like nobody's business. And the worry for me as his son was what they were feeding him. And it was very much highly processed 
uh, very um, sloppy food that was easily digestible. And admittedly, he had he had come to a point where he was unable to fend for himself in any way, and he had to be spoon fed. And that's why we ended up unable to cope for him. I mean, we were with him 24-7 until we couldn't, just could not do it on our own and lifting him to the loo and all those sort of things, um, my sister and I. But it struck me looking at that that a lot of people, when they get not as advanced as him, although um, it would also help them, is that they're not eating or they're not being given um, enough fresh produce um, and and if there was a team, as you've described, is able to be able to grow stuff that they can eat, the nutrient value of that in their diet must be, uh, you know, if the will is there, would be yeah. amazing for people. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Richard. I mean, I'm also a beekeeper, so I. Oh, are you? Yes, yes. So I know about the therapeutic properties of both honey and propolis. You know, I've used honey as a nurse, you know, on wounds. And I know that the propolis is antiviral and antibacterial. So, you know, you've got, you have your own medicine, your own back garden. You know, um, I'm not suggesting that it replaces, you know, prescription medicines by any manner of means. But, you know, um, if times are going to be difficult and we're going to have difficulty sourcing medicine mm. things you know we we need to think about natural natural medicines as i say i was giving out the uh, recipe for hydroxychloroquine um during lockdown and, and during the pandemic and it's so easy to make it's unbelievable it's in citrus fruit peel you just boil the peel for two hours and the liquid left is your hydroxychloroquine it's, it's, wow yeah simple simple as that um I, so, and this is the thing. I mean, it, what what's encouraging again is this sort of imaginative taking back control and thinking, and it does throw us back to the 1940s during you know the dig for victory and all of that. Us again having the the gumption to get up and and work together as as a a group of people for the better good, rather than th this sort of somewhat lazy convenient world that we live in at the moment, where although it is convenient, where's the satisfaction? As you say, seeing somebody smiling because you've suddenly transformed their patio back to the patio rather than that buddlier, which uh, I have problems on a wall I've got here, um, crumbling it away, um, is, it, it, it's so rewarding helping people. And I think we've lost, we've lost that understanding of what that really means and how it helps us. Uh, absolutely. You know, we are so disconnected from nature. Um, you know, we forget that we are natural beings. We are part of nature. You know, uh, we look as nature as outside of us. We are we are part of that symbiotic relationship. And we've abused that relationship for so long for the sake of convenience, mm. and for, you know, to benefit and profiting others. Um, and it's time to redress that balance and, you know, come together and share our skills and knowledge and it's strength in numbers and strength in unity you know um, and they say that a, judge, a society can be judged on how it treats its vulnerable well need I say more look at the homeless you know on the streets you know as I say the abuse and neglect of the elderly um, you know need I say more whereas the vision that I, I know I particularly have with the time banking system that I, I've been working on is that if we grow in numbers with people with sufficient skills and knowledge. We can care for people with complex health healthcare needs in the comfort of their own home. They're not having to give up their homes, their precious pets. We can care for their pets. We can do their cooking. We can do their cleaning. We can do their gardening, you know, all for free. Mm. We can That's care for somebody complex needs 24 hours a day if we all came together in sufficient numbers for free yes that is the kind of society i want and that i want for my grandchildren and for the future generations to come it is strange that we're in a position in which the um the councils and the Hello. government do, can you hear me we lost lost uh, contact there I, say, I think we froze then yes oh sorry about that um it's interesting. I was just going to say it's interesting that we're in a we're in this situation where we've almost 
come to accept, and I think a lot of people like yourself and others, of course, have not come to accept this, that we're being dished out a load of policies from high above, let's say, uh, those that uh, think they're in control, um, which are very anti-human. Yes. And you, and you do think, hang on, if I was designing a society that we, we are living in, would I design what we have now with these policies where people are being ta- bedroom tax and, um, you know, if you ringing up the GP at half past eight and if you can't get through tough or it's three, four weeks to get an appointment. And and then, of course, all of the shenanigans of the uh, the, the recent years of um, this so-called virus that's been going around. Um, if you were to design that and say, oh, I'm going to offer that to the public, would you like to live like this? I think we'd all be going, uh, no, thank you. And yet we've all sort of sleepwalked into this. But it's time we did wake up from that sleep. And the more we hear about the the more humane ways of living, living with nature, with each other, and, and not gauging everything by money all the time in which these corporations are sort of doing um, has has got to be a, a bright and cheerful future for us. Absolutely, Richard. Well, when I discuss this concept with people, the first thing they say to me is they haven't got any time. Right. And of course, if you're too busy with your nose to the grindstone, running on that treadmill, trying to you know drum up these iou notes to pay bills that you don't need to pay well yes you don't have time but if you take yourself out of that system lawfully fight it with the notices you suddenly don't need that money to be paying these fraudulent bills you suddenly have time and then we can come together and create this beautiful world of unity so tell me about these bills, because you say that uh, you're fighting against them lawfully. And um, yes. so what sort of bills are you talking about? Um, well, we're using their own acts and statutes against them, basically, using their own legislation. Um, thankfully, there's so many of them. They've got millions and millions. And, you know, they shoot themselves in the foot. You know, you've got one that says that one. Oh, and at that moment... Everything goes very quiet. Let's see if the uh, the uh, s- signal will pick up. Are you back there? Sorry, we had we had another fr- we had another freeze. There's a there's a lot of rain in the atmosphere right. at the moment. So yes, yeah, so sorry, you broke off when you said that you're using legislation basically against itself because there's huge numbers of it, and and it is interesting when you look at it because one says one thing, and then you look at the other one and go, well, hang on a minute, these are both in conflict with each other. Absolutely. You know, it's complete nonsense. I mean, of course, we are sovereign men and women and their acts and statutes have no jurisdiction over us anyway. And, yeah. that, and that's before you bring into the fact it's a treasonous government and the invocation of the, you know, um, Article 61 of the Magna Carta. But you put all that aside, you can fight using that. Um, but the most we found the most successful way has been to use their own acts and statutes against them. So it has been a bit of um, a learning curve having to dive in and educate ourselves as to which acts and statutes are applicable and once you've learned the basic basic six really which are mainly applicable to it all and you know fight the fraud lawfully and put in your schedule of fees you know how much it's going to cost them uh, for your time in answering their letters their phone calls their emails their illegal warrants trespassing on on your property uh, particularly if you've already got a notice of um, removal of implied rights of access on the door so yeah it's, it's quite fun and games really and do, do you have a website that people can find out what you're up to? Actually, no, um, we we don't. Um, we have a telegram, two telegram groups. Because we set all this up when we were knee deep in lockdown, a lot of the group were a little bit, you know, paranoid. Um, yes. So we didn't have, um, we didn't develop a website. Um, but we do have telegram groups. We have the uh, us community. That's the time banking. Um, the Cornwall group 
Di, who is uh, in charge of the Cornwall Group, the Time Banking Group, she did set up a website with one of her gang and it is the uh, US community. And the whole idea is that the US time banking groups around the country um, tap into that and share their successes and failures. And um, also, you know, if there's a dearth of skills in one area, you know, but a glut in another, how we can sort of support one another uh, with our skills and knowledge. So there is a website set up by uh, Diane in Cornwall. Um, but I have to say, us on the world have been pretty lacking and poor in tapping into that. Right. Well, I'll, I'll grab that one, that that one in Cornwall, and put that. I'll grab that after the after we finish recording, and um, put that in the description so people can go and have a look and and um, work out uh, how they you know feel about it. And and with your Telegram group, do you welcome new people coming along? Absolutely. Yes, we've got um, the rapid response group on Wirral. Um, we've got the US community time banking. That's strictly just for the US community on the Wirral. Um, there's no point in anyone else tapping into that because unless they're being part of the time banking system, sharing skills and knowledge, it, it's not really relevant to them. Right. Um, but we also have a WhatsApp group for the rapid response team as well. As well. But we will cover all areas of the Wirral and hopefully trying to support other people and setting up similar in their locality as well. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? I mean, this is what we really need to see is more and more groups setting up for their area. uh, And so that you have that rapid response for somebody who suddenly, you know, mysterious people have turned up at the door demanding money and all that. And you're a bit frightened. You don't know what to do. And being able to just give a a, a call instead of to the police, to your rapid response. And uh, as you say, you've managed to turn them away, having them scurry away with their tail between their legs, because presumably you're, you're doing as I keep hearing from others, that you're, you're asking questions they cannot answer. That's correct. Yes. Tying them up in knots going, you know, where's the liability order or where's this or where's the contract or where, you know, and I'm happy to pay you the money if you can just show me where I signed up for this and those sort of things. That's it. And usually the warrant is illegal. Um, you know, it's not signed or it's on some kind of electronic device. So you just cite the King's Bench ruling from 16th of December 2022. I can't remember the actual reference number right now, um, but that declared all, you know, unsigned warrants illegal. So it has to be a paper document with a wet ink signature and the court seal. So that's the first question we ask, you know. Wow. Um, and it, isn't it amazing that they've, they've it's in a way... They've just left themselves so open to to honest everyday people being able to say, hold on a minute, you're not even operating by their own rules. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems they don't even know their own rules and they're just, just chances. Absolutely. You're quite right, Richard. They don't know their own rules. Uh, first time we had um, a, a, an enforcement agent turn up here for um, gas and electric uh, meters because we have our own. And I had the rapid response team, we had 13 of the team on the driveway. And we had three lots of police come and go during the day. One time they turned up with a great big yellow van to arrest us all. And we had one policewoman um, tell us that she's an ex-magistrate and that she knew the law. No one knew the law like her. She didn't have a clue what she was talking about. Um, And they were trying to enforce this illegal warrant on electronic device, you know. um, So we we put um, Merseyside Chief of the illegal and unlawful behaviour of our own agents. So, um, yeah, so since then, we've noticed a change in the police behaviour and they they don't really engage with us. They stand off and just observe. And then after about an hour or two, we'll tend to go away with the tail between the legs. So I guess that's the thing. If you don't get angry, if you're very, you know, reasonable, if your attitude is reasonable to these people and you're asking the questions, I suppose the police are there in case there is a um, a, a fight breaks out or punch ups or, you know, a breach of the peace, I suppose, is the correct terminology. Yeah. Um, and, and that's all they can get involved with other than just being somewhat intimidating by their very presence because they're wearing a comedy outfit. Um, with all the, you know, the bells and whistles that go with it. Um, so yeah, t- tell me ab- about this. Absolutely. The- uh, we've developed a strategy now um, where the homeowner um, don't engage with them, try not to open the door, just ring one of the rapid response team, and those first on site will be the ones to... 
to engage? We, yes, we nominate two of the group. Sorry, my, my eyes be washing pad and eye infection. Um, so we nominate two of the group um, who are more knowledgeable, competent and confident to engage. And we make sure that everyone else is there to record with their mobile phones and to witness any interaction. Um, so we try now not to, you know, because obviously initially we were, we were a little bit unprofessional, shouting over one another and a little bit yes. accessible and, you know, it was a bit chaotic. Whereas we've now, you know, uh, refined ourselves now and developed a strategy. And that strategy, as I say, has proven to work. We've got 100% success. Well, that's brilliant. And I th you raise an interesting point there because very often you'll see videos online where people are repelling um, bailiffs and people like that. And, and you see that there's anger rising or they're getting a bit rude or, or what have you. And it, and it does come across as a bit unprofessional. If you're new to this, you're thinking, oh, I don't want to you know, have to behave like that in order to repel. And really and truly, you don't need to. You don't need to be, you know, sort of showing your muscles and swearing at people and telling them to, to, to you know, using foul language. You can be firm, but you can still, you can still stay honourable and, and, it, and it's going to work out better for you if you do, presumably. Absolutely. Um, you know, had we been a real rowdy rabble swearing and threatening, the when the police turned up with that yellow van, I've no doubt we'd have all been in there, in the back of yeah. it. Uh, but the fact that we weren't, um, and I was relaying cups of tea out to the, the gang on the driveway and we were passing around biscuits and anyone wanted to use the bathroom, you know. So it was very jovial in that respect, yes. you know. And... Um, so, because uh, obviously with it being my address, although I have the knowledge, the str it is very stressful. Uh, yes, of course. Even I needed the, the team, you know, and, and they've been great. But likewise, I've gone to other people's addresses and, you know, and we just keep it amicable, uh, calm. And, yeah, just pass around the cups of tea and coffee and the biscuits on the driveway. And, and we just keep the bailiffs and the police the other side of the gate. And then once um, it's got through to whoever makes these orders, um, that we're not backing down and that we're on the right side of the law, um, well, then they get the, you know, the call to step down and off they go. And disappear, yeah, to go yeah. and hassle somebody else. Um, so do, do you deal with, am I right in thinking you're dealing with other things like electricity, gas and those sort of things? Because, I mean, we've had the energy bill passed now and people are fearful that they're going to be persuaded to have a smart meter and of course the headlines is they've got these um, bullies um, have got the rights now to break into your house and force oh hang on um, we may have lost I think I may have lost the connection um, oh no we're back we're back sorry about that ladies and gentlemen uh, there was a slight moment there as I as I mentioned smart meters um, and people are slightly worried now, as I say, that they can break into your house and force you to have one of these. What's the situation with that, with you, your, with the way that you deal with things? Well, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to come on your show, to be honest, Richard, because the consequences of the energy bill for people really bother me, really bothers me, because I know that people are at risk of losing their homes. And as you say, bullies breaking down the, the uh, doors. But we have to remember that the energy bill, it is legislation passed by the UK government parliament, which is a registered corporation, which has actually went into liquidation on the 12th of September. But by the by, um, it's a corporation, private corporation. So therefore the legislation it passes is nothing more than company policy. I'm not an employee of the UK government PLC corporation. So their policies don't have any bearing on me whatsoever. Um, but even if they did, because it's a registered corporation, what's called the um, Clearfield Doctrine applies, which means that it is nothing more than company policy. So they have no rights, no authority and no jurisdiction to impose anything on any man or woman. And that's before we take into account the likes of the affidavit of Baron David Ward um, that st still stands as fact in law that consent of the governed is needed and they've never had our formal um, consent. So we just have to remind ourselves of our sovereignty and that our 
law, natural law, as sovereign men and women is far superior than mere company policy and they have no right to impose anything on any of us and that we stand together and we act lawfully um, and stay strong in numbers and fight this tyranny. Well, there you go. And and this is the thing where if you don't know that, if you're not familiar with this, and this is why it's so important that, you know, you come on the show like this and other shows and, and other people find out about this, because people will assume that because it's a piece of legislation uh, that they have to obey it because they are falling into the trap of giving jurisdiction and then allowing people in and, and going, oh, golly, I don't want this, but, you know... It, it's law not realizing it's no it's not law it's legislation and you're a living breathing man or woman and you're not part of the as you say you're not an employee of the uh, the plc um and 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 sadly of course we can't reach everybody and that's really sad if people have had it put in and they and and they listen to this and they go bloody hell i've got one of these wretched things i don't want it what can they do? Well, they can write um, retrospectively to the energy supplier, to the energy company, and they can cite um, health. Well, the fact that they've not given consent and that mm. they've got concerns for their health with the electromagnetic radiation poisoning. And then, of course, there's the fire risk. Um, as we know that they just explode, you know, instantly um, without warning. So um, no consent, no contract, and you don't need you know, have anything forced upon you whether it be a prepayment meter a smart meter or anything else i spoke to a lady from the i forget the exact name of it the it's an emf uh, radiation protection trust or concern trust and she wrote an open letter to the government about these going into people's houses You've gone again have i gone again yeah. Um, hello. <laughs> hello. Sorry about that. We'll we'll wind up the interview in a second. Uh, the inter um, but I wrote to this lady um, from this uh, radiation trust who's looking into the problem of these things, and um, she was on the show. And one of the interesting things that she said is that in a freedom of information uh, um, request, she asked the government who was liable. If something went wrong, if you had um, problems with um, health as a result of this thing, or if it caught fire or whatever, who was liable? The government, because it's their policy, or the company that fitted it? And she said to me that the government said to her, they didn't know. Very interesting. Mm. So, you know, if the government... So in other words, no one's insured this. No, no one, no one's taken the liability. So if something happens to somebody, uh, then ultimately it's got to be down to the government whose policy it is to who's enforced other um, businesses to uh, put these things in. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that will be a sting that they will not like. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Neve, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you. I know we've had a few internet connection problems, uh, but don't let that worry you. The, um, I think people will be absolutely um, excited to hear what's going on where you are in the Wirral. Uh, we need more people like you setting up groups across the country doing this and understanding. And, of course, I'm fortunate that I'm talking to many of these. I spoke to the Hereford uh, the Common Law Group the other day. Um, so it's so gr great to know that this sort of stuff is going on. Because one of the things that I get from pe either people emailing in or when I'm doing my talks in person is people feel very isolated. They think it's they're on their own, but yeah. they're really, they're not. More and more groups like this are setting up. Absolutely, you know, people aren't on their own. Um, you know, they just need to go and look at their local stand in the park, see, make sure it's still, you know, um, they're still meeting and that's how you meet like-minded people. Or go on, you know, your local relevant Telegram and, you know, social media groups uh, for like-minded um, reach out. But there's a lot going on around the country. Um, I know I'm networking with other sort of community organisers. There's a lot going on around the country. Um, so I can connect people with their local group um, if they want 
to make contact with you, Richard. And, um, you know, because I've got lots of contacts around the country now with what I've been doing. Um, but people are not on their own. And they yeah. Need- that. Well, it seems to me, I mean, with, with, with my show and bringing lots of people like yourself on, I really ought to have a page on my website that lists all these groups and societies um, that are there to help people so that people have got, a, you know, a central hub or something. But uh, yes, no. So, um, well, I, I dare say there'll be a lot of inquiries, so I'll farm them over to you if that's OK. Right. But that, that's a great idea, you know, put it on your website, you know, as you say, a central hub for people to link into to see what's going on in their local area. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, and if anyone's watching, it would care to sort of set up a page that can do that because I just don't get the time. Yeah. But that's the thing. Uh, then I can link to that from from the Web page and um, and then, you know, that sort of thing can come uh, grow. And that would be that would be fantastic. Um, but, with time and growing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for telling us about time banking. I think a lot of people would be interested in that. Also, of course, the uh, the natural law um, stuff, which I think more and more people are beginning to wake up to, which is fantastic, which must... I mean, um, I, I reported the other day, and, and I've seen it on a number of web pages, council web pages, in which they're they're now so worried they're putting on, you know, oh, you can't use the freedom of the land argument anymore. And the fact that they're putting that on means that they they clearly are getting a lot of these things coming through and they're trying to push back. But of course, that's the whole point, that you can use these arguments because that's the last thing they want you to do. <laughs> Well, of course, when you know what they say, a wild beast thrashes most in its dying moments. And yes. they know that we're waking up to the scam and they're panicking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They are. Neve, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and I hope the, the audience have got something out of all of this, which I'm absolutely sure we're reassuring them that we are waking up and lots of things are happening. Um, and of course, I'll link to I'll get you to send me the, uh, the, the info for the lady in Cornwall. Um, and if you've got links to your telegram groups or anything that people can come along on, I'll put those in the description. But okay. for the time being, thank you so much, Neve. It's been absolutely wonderful. I'll be back with more monologues, of course. And uh, until next time, bye-bye.